All right, so uh, I thought then we would uh, immediately transition and just uh, just have a, a short chat about uh, the data preprocessing tasks, and then at some stage, uh, I just want us to just work through a few a few things in a Jupyter notebook that I have shared, just so we can um, get an appreciation of exactly how we go about performing some of these uh, generic uh, preprocessing tasks. And you notice that irrespective of the type of data that you're working with, there are certain things that you 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 just have to do, like de de duplicate. Uh, I mean, deduplication, for instance, uh, uh, getting rid of or handling null values, for instance. And then there are certain things that are only specific to certain types of data, uh, like remove of stop words. You can't remove stop words from categorical data, right? You can only remove stop words from um, um, uh, text, for instance. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, so again, um, uh, a reminder here that uh, we are essentially just again still looking at data preparation here, uh, and we, when we are cleaning up the data, some of the generic things that you end up doing is, um, like I've mentioned before, trying to get rid of the duplicates, um, handling null values, and then uh, dealing with outliers. So if you come across if you have, uh, if you're working with student results and you have one person who got 90% and everybody else is hovering around the 50s and 40s, it will probably be a good, a good idea for you to make a decision um, with regards to how you're going to handle that one observation, right? Perhaps just exclude it from the entire data set or something. Uh, or perhaps collect more data so that you have more of observations that fall within that particular range. Uh, what I've done in the past is I just I, I get rid of outliers and it's it's happened quite a lot. So uh, working with um, descriptive metadata from ETDs, for instance, when we come across um, a school where we have very few ETDs, like ID, for instance, what what we've done in past analysis is we've just decided to exclude ID because when performing an Interfaculty analysis, it really wouldn't make sense to look at IDE as, um, as an independent entity because you only have a few observations there. <clears throat> but depending on the analysis, perhaps you just merge it with uh, the School of Education itself because it turns out that the, the subject area that is handled in the two faculties is more or less the same. And the same goes for schools like VET, for instance, and medicine. Right? Um, so again, when, when it comes to specific types of um, uh, data like uh, textual content here, um, uh, it turns out that it's, it's the one type of data where you, you get to do a lot of things, right? So stemming, uh, stop with uh, removal, you might uh, want to make sure that you, you, you use um, or you transform text using a consistent casing, for instance. So make a decision as to whether you're going to use all lowercase or all uppercase letters. Right? Um, and again, so the, the generic step that you go through here is you remove the duplicates, you remove the null values, you deal with the outliers, and then finally you perform the uh, preprocessing steps associated with uh, textual content. So uh, stop word removal, um, um, case folding, uh, stemming of the words themselves. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's an explanation here. Okay, there is an explanation. So a con comprehensive list of uh, things that you, you tend to, to do insofar as text is concerned here is uh, uh, make sure that your, 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 your text is represented using a consistent casing. Usually I've gotten away with all lower case. If you want, you can go with all upper case, but certainly not uh, camel casing. And then you, you go through a process of uh, stemming the words, so you want to make sure that uh, the examples here, but you want to make sure that things like women, woman, um, are actually stem to one thing because they're the same thing. Right? Uh, remove stop words. By default, when you're working with text, you typically have access to stop words associated with the different languages like English, French, um, Portuguese, for instance. Uh, but, but if you find yourself in a situation where you're working in a particular domain that has additional stop words, you want to make sure that you take those things into account. So for instance, if you are working with text uh, associated with ETDs at UNSA, we know that Zambia is bound to be a stop word. 
University of Zambia is bound to be a stop word. It doesn't make sense that you include it in your um, in your uh, uh, final vector that's going to contain those unique unique phrases. Why? Because it's a common common occurrence. It's something that you are bound to find in all of the different ETDs, right? on the cover page, the University of Zambia or something. Um, you want to make sure that you remove all the different punctuations. This can be tricky depending on the domain you're working in. So things like commas, uh, question marks, exclamation marks. Um, again, there are packages, we'll soon see in examples, there are packages that you can use that have default punctuations that already exist. But you want to be careful when you're working with, let's say, text that contains mathematical formulas, for instance, right? Uh, and, and, and if those, those particular uh, things that you incorporate into the formula are important to you. Deduplication, missing values, and then tokenization, although the tokenization part is really associated with uh, transformation of the text itself. <clears throat> okay, I mean, so just examples here, uh, uh, what you're doing is uh, making sure that uh, words like these uh, are considered to be the same. If, if you remember, now, I would like to think this is the same in respect to the programming language you're referring to, but if you remember our discussion of Python, we said that Python is case sensitive, right? So you want to make sure that uh, uh, you normalize um, the text to a, a common or consistent casing. Uh, there is, I think, uh, hmm, there should be a built-in, a Python built-in called, uh, let me see. There should be a, a Python built-in code uh, lower, right? Just a little example here. Uh, just to showcase how trivial this is when you're working with text. So in Python, there's a built-in function. Uh, Uh, so what you'd be doing is, uh, oh, is this? oh, because this is an object, I guess, it would be x dot lower, right? Right, so you want to make sure that uh, all these different represent, and this, you notice from the Jupyter Notebook that this, these are the things that you'd be doing, really, to make sure that um, this thing here is made to look the same as, um, uh, as its uh, lowercase representation, right? If you want, uh, I guess it should be upper. Now, I uh, I don't know if there are people that have, have bothered to, I always, I just remember, yeah, I always uh, say lower or, or upper here, but I wonder if people have thought about maybe title casing proper, right? Do you think that would be consistent? If you decided to say, instead of lower or upper, I'm going to, to go with title casing. So all the ways are going to have to be proper, right? So the University of Zambia, the text representation, all the texts will have the first letters uppercase. So I think you can do this proper. No? Ooh. I guess I'm, 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 swapping, I'm swapping things around here. I think proper should be, proper should be here. Do apologize here. Uh, okay, I was referring to Excel. Sorry. Uh, but there should be a way of uh, converting. I don't know if anyone knows the, a way of converting a, a text from whatever casing into uh, a format where the first, the initial, the initial character of every word is going to be an uppercase let everything else is lowercase. Uh, but think about this for a second. It would still be consistent, right? Because each word will have um, the first characters being um, uppercase, and then everything else is lowercase. I don't know if that's, um, that makes sense to people here. Anyone know of a Python function for I'm obsessive here. Why dot? Oh, shoot. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, you found it. Thanks. Oh, title. Thank you. There we go. Thanks. Uh, and again, because you're running on an object. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you'd uh, you'd convert it into something like this, right? In case you're thinking, but what about numbers? It really doesn't matter whether you have numbers in your text or not. Uh, if you apply law, it's just going to be the same, right? Um, I don't know if that makes sense here. Uh, um, right, so stemming essentially just involves you uh, converting all the different derived words into their root form, right? So I gave an example of woman. Men, man is the same. Uh, females, female is the same. Zambia, Zambians. Uh, I don't know what else is there. Zambia, Zambians. Zambian, right? That's that's the same thing. You're referring to the same. You'd be, you'd be really trying to describe a, a similar concept, right? So it makes sense that you just reduce it to its common stem. Um, um, and, and, and really the idea is to make sure that you reduce on, because remember when you're working with text, right, the, the resulting um, matrix that you're going to be working with or the vector is going to be really large, so I want to make sure that it's as small as possible. Uh, and it turns out really that um, there, there are a number of ways of uh, stemming, um, but Porter stemmer happens to be one of the most uh, widely used uh, uh, stemming algorithms out there, and it's quite easy in Python, we'll look at examples just now. Um, it is uh, the same stemming algorithm that is, or that was used to represent things we are seeing here. Uh, like this, absent, right? Uh, acad, well, is, I guess, it's academ, you know, um, Zambia study or something, right? Uh, in case you're wondering why Zambia is not stemmed here, it's, it's because, and we'll get to this at some stage, it's because, um, so I think in this case we were, we were coming up with a representation that would have um, uh, trigrams, right? So a combination, at the maximum combination of at least three ways that follow each other, right? So what you end up doing is you just stem the last part. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming this is a uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, revision for most of us, right? I don't know if we've done this already somewhere. To processing of text. No, anyone? Yes, no, no. You must. I would appreciate it if you told me the parts that you think you'd need more examples, and uh, it's difficult to make assumptions in certain instances, right? Uh, Okay, also oh, more examples here. Um, so canonical versions, country versus countries, it's the same thing. Uh, now what would be interesting here is to, if you, were, if you happen to be working on, um, I guess a problem that would involve working with Zambian local languages, figuring out, because you can't use Porter's stemma to stem words in the local language, right? It would actually give you the wrong results. It would still stem them, but they wouldn't really be correct things. What would be interesting is if you could come up with uh, a way of doing that for local languages. And it doesn't have to be all the local languages, but maybe Bembo or something, right? Uh, it turns out it's not easy for certain languages. I know of people um, <coughs> working in the lab I used to work in that are uh, working on a number of such natural language processing problems, right, with Isizulu and Isitosa and all those different languages. Uh, yeah, so so it's food for thought if you are looking for maybe inspiration. Uh, we have a lot of people um, in the School of Education and I think Humanities that um, work in this area, languages. Not this, but uh, languages, right? So they, they've already studied the different languages. So it's not like you'd have to go out there and redo things. You just have to sit down with them to try and understand exactly how the Chichewa vocabulary is or how the Silos vocabulary is, right? I mean, that be it. Um, right. And then, so the other thing here is, uh, again, stop words. Uh, 
typically there are packages, um, like I said, that you can take advantage of that will have predefined um, stop words for the different popular languages. Afrikaans, you know, English are not popular, but languages that are represented online or languages that have a lot of support online. So these might be small uh, languages like Afrikaans, but the people actively working to ensure that um, uh, content in Afrikaans online is properly represented, right? I hope we can do that for Chicheo and Bembo or something. So all you're doing is just removing those common words, the stop words, um, and, and the idea is to try and avoid uh, them impacting the overall re relevance of, of the text, text uh, content that you'd be working with. But like I said, um, in certain instances, depending on the domain, it might just become necessary that you might want to add additional stop words to um, the default language stop words that you'd be working with. So to your default English stop words, uh, if you're working within uh, the life sciences, maybe you remove uh, common words specific to that particular domain. If you'd be working with uh, laws, for instance, you include those uh, common stop words in laws. I don't know what they are here, right? Um, Again, it's very easy, so you use, uh, I know NLTK has, um, has a way of, um, of um, accessing English stop words, which is, for the most part, for most of the examples, we'll, we'll be using the English stop words, so it, you see how trivial it is to actually do this, right? Um, and then, again, when it comes to removing punctuations, all you have to do is just um, uh, reuse, um, th there's already existing packages that allow you to do this in Python, but, but um, also what you can do is you can just take advantage of um, Python to isolate them individually yourself. So you know the, stop, the punctuations, right? Commas, semicolons, exclamation marks, ampersand sign, all those funny things, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then um, you want to make sure that you're able to detect um, duplicate entries. Now, the, the duplicate entry is a, a bit interesting here because there's, there's different ways of looking at duplicate entries, right? So it, it could be the case that uh, duplicates occur in a column within your data set, or a duplicate could be associated with a complete row, right? So those are things to think about. Uh, and you'd have to figure out exactly how to isolate those different things here. Uh, Like if you had a, so a row of student records and um, you have an identifier, for instance. Uh, I'm trying to think of a better way of trying to explain instances where you'd, um, instances where you'd, you'd have uh, uh, duplicates in a row and duplicates in a, in a column, right? So, Okay, so you have you have a record that has a student, uh, okay, student ID, NRC, uh, and perhaps uh, okay, let's just say major, right? Now, in an ideal case, if you're looking at detecting duplicates by row, maybe if you have uh, instances where you have this x, uh, y. X, Z, uh, v, 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 you know that uh, these are, this is a duplicate row, right? But what if uh, for, some, for some reason the, the data that you are working with tells you to say this particular person has an NRC of, of let's say P, but the student ID is the same, right? If, if you are looking at detecting duplicates by row, then uh, Obviously, you, you wouldn't be able to, to figure out that these particular rows are the same, right? But if you're trying to detect duplicates based by column, then you'd be able to pick out to say, in actual fact, this entry is the same as this, and maybe there was just a data entry. That's the reason why maybe you have different values for the NRC. And, and again, really, um, uh, you see from the examples in here that uh, detection of duplicates is pretty trivial with pandas, right? It's just as easy as uh, running the dot duplicate function, right? Um, and then that's it. And I know, right? People are thinking, but uh, what if I wanted to do it before, right? You can, I guess it's fine. 
so you can detect duplicates if you if you feel much better detecting duplicates in Excel and then moving them to Pandas or to your linear algorithm, you can do that as well. It doesn't matter what tool you're using. But if you are looking at incorporating, you know, Python Pandas into your into your um, workflow, your pipeline, just uh, remember that there's easier ways of doing this, and there are examples in the Jupyter notebook just now. <coughs> all right. Uh, again, um, so you will notice really that. Uh, all right, see, fine. You notice really that for 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 some of these. Uh, steps or processes that we're looking at, um, a decision would have to be made on what exactly you'd want to do, right? You wouldn't just, uh, you wouldn't just uh, decide to say, uh, for this particular data set, what I want to do is I just want to detect duplicates by row, right? Um, you'd have to sit down, I guess, after analyzing the data to decide if there are certain fields that might necessitate that you, you detect du duplicates by column as well. So the same goes for missing values. You'd have to decide on whether you are going to discard uh, entries with missing values or if you are going to uh, come up with default values that you are going to insert into the um, columns with null values. Uh, and in most instances, those decisions are actually dictated by the amount of data that you have. So if you are someone like Francis who has only 700 or so uh, observations, um, you don't have the luxury of excluding data. You want to make sure that you find ways of uh, fixing the problems associated with missing values, for instance. Um. Uh, so for, I don't know if we have an example, but for numeric values, it's very common for you to just come up with an average. So if you, if you have, um, and again, it depends on the problem. If you have, if you are looking at in income levels of people, and it so happens that one of your observation has no value for the income, what you could do is decide to say you're just going to get the average of all uh, the records that have values, and then pad or insert the null value with the average. Um, for grades, what I do myself is I just replace it with a zero. Well, at least for the example with the student grades. Okay, so this is what I was saying here. So dropping the fields or replacing them uh, or using a derived field, essentially. But you'll have to make the decision yourself. 